What are some ways we can talk to the most challenging people around us about God and Jesus? That's what we're going to talk about today. Finally, our character can make and break our mission. Knowledge and wisdom are packed in a person, so to speak. But if that person does not embody the virtue of the kingdom he serves, he will undermine his message and handicap his efforts. Greg Kokel. Today, we're going to talk about Greg Kokel's book, Tactics, a game plan for discussing your Christian convictions. I found this to be a very dense book. And if you want to hear some good ways that you can talk primarily to some of the most challenging people around you, this is a great book to go. And we can't nearly go into all the examples he gives because his book is dense. It's not very long, but the information is so thick with suggestions and ideas and how to talk to people. But we're going to give an overview of this book to see if you're interested in this book. I want to say at the beginning, I don't like the word tactic. It just feels to me that people don't want to be part of a tactic. And I get it. He's writing this book for us to read, but I don't think in general people want to feel like they're part of a tactic. But he said that what we want to do is use skills in order to inform people better, in order to impart people with more information. And he calls it tactical wisdom. So that's what the main focus, he says, of his book is. And he says in general that if we are going to talk to people about Jesus, we have to know the message of the kingdom. We have to know how to respond to people when they throw obstacles at us. That's part of what we need to do in order to challenge people. I also feel, interestingly enough, different ways about this, because, and he'll talk about this, because I believe that a philosopher, if anyone would ever convert me, it would be someone who could argue with me philosophically. But in the end, it was my friend Em, who is not a debater. She's not someone, but she knows what she knows, and she's adamant about it, and she knew when to bring me to her pastor to ask more questions. Who was that kind of guy who could answer every question? And I had a lot of them. But he said that we have to know the difference between strategy and tactics. He says strategy are the big picture, the large scale operations, but the tactics are the things that we're actually going to do to position ourselves in a way that people will hear what we're saying. We're not trying to overwhelm people with fake information. We're not trying to I don't know, convince them outside of their brain using tactics like that. That's the devil's work, right? Instead, what we want to do is we want to present our information in the best way possible. So I like the idea of this book, and I really like this book. I think it gives some very good ideas, but he wants us to be able to answer people in the way that makes the most amount of difference. He says that, first of all, tactics are powerful and we shouldn't abuse them. Is we could use them to make people feel stupid, look silly, he says. We don't want to do that. That's not the point of any of this. We're not trying to win a debate. We are trying to win someone's heart over for Christ so that they take up this invitation that Christ offers to everybody. And he wants us to know that he is okay with us being assertive, direct, challenging. But we also don't want to be abusive or beat people down. This is about dialogue, right? We want to talk to each other. And he says that our mind is the first thing that God gave us to defend against error. And that's really what we're trying to do here is to use our brain, have clear thinking about it. We're not trying to rationalize things. We're not trying to people give false arguments. And we're not trying to say, too, that God needs us to work tricks because none of this is tricks. In order to, you know, tell people about God, this is just about framing your conversation in the proper way. And this is where this book really has its strength, is talking about how to talk to people and then also how to debate some of the arguments we hear back. I was that Christian that was chock full of arguments. My dad was too. Um, My dad was more angry about it. He didn't want to hear the other side. I was more open to dialogue about the whole situation. Here's my challenges to you. How do you answer them? And I really wanted to know the answer. My dad really did not. He just wanted to live the life he wanted to live. 
So we have to make sure that we talk to people with an open heart, that we're listening to what they're saying, that we have an answer to give to them, and that we know how to deal, he says, with dissent, that we know how to argue in the proper, he called it principled way. And he says arguments are good. You know, I'm not much of an argument person. Maybe you could guess that. But arguments, debates, he says it's fine. We, we try to get away from them. We don't like to argue with people. We don't want to debate with people. You can debate them into the idea that they're not thinking about. And that's essentially, I think, where my pastor came from. He never got argumentative. He was gentle and kind about all of it. But he had a ready response. I mean, he was a campus pastor. He's going to get hit with all the things all the time, right? So I think campus pastors are particularly geared to be able to answer people. But in this case, he's saying it's, it's fine. We can debate, we can argue, we can still be kind, and we still can present the gospel in a clear way. And then he brings up the point, too, with Jesus being man, 100% man, 100% God. When Jesus has talked to people about himself and his missions and what he's going to say, if you're listening along in the Bible in small steps, we're getting towards the end of John. Jesus talks to people where they're at. He knows how to reach people with what thoughts are going on, what troubles and struggles they're having. And he's not afraid to challenge people on some of their beliefs. Like the one guy who says, well, I want to go bury my father and then I'll come back. We don't even know if that guy's father is dead. And I suspect he wasn't by the way that Jesus treated him because he said, no, you come now. Jesus knew when to challenge people. He knew when to be kind to people. He knew when to heal people. And he knew when to put a discussion back upon them. That was the whole point of his challenging to the Pharisees. He noticed his level of challenging went up whenever he was talking to the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sanhedrin because they were educated. Their level of discourse was harsher, but it was also educated. Jesus talked to them differently than he talked to, let's say, the Phoenician woman that he talked about, dog scraps at the table. And he says that it's important in his view, and I liked this idea. His goal is not to win someone over for Christ. He says, quote, all I want to do is put a stone in someone's shoe. I want to give him something worth thinking about, something he can't ignore because it continues to poke him in a good way. So he's not going for the home run. And I think sometimes we get involved in that when we try to talk about Jesus. I want to start out with answering your challenge and then hit a home run so that by the end of this, you're asking to be baptized. Doesn't often work that way. And in fact, in my own life, people talk to me about God from the time I was nine years old. And when did I become a Christian? In college. But those people were planting seeds. Those people were answering questions here and there. Nobody hit a home run. And even my friend, Em, at the end, when she talked to me about Jesus, she got to see my baptism. She got to be my sponsor at my baptism. But she was the finisher, right? She was the person who sewed this up, brought me to her pastor. Well, I guess my pastor was who sewed me up, but it took a long time getting there. And it was people along the way that put these seeds in me thinking. And it wasn't even necessarily all Christians, interestingly enough. Some were, but some of it was my reading. I loved reading about religion, all religions. I just loved reading about it all. And so some of this came from books. I spent two summers in Israel, archaeological dig, and some of it was me asking people, well, why is it that Jesus keeps here with us while you tell me on the, I was on a tour, that there were over 80 people at the time of Jesus who claimed to be the Messiah. Jerusalem, he called it, was a Messiah factory. Well, that was because Jesus was the only one who came back from the dead. This was a Jewish guy on a tour of the city. I mean, it stuck with me. You know, it stuck with me a long time. I wasn't even thinking about being a Christian at that point. And in fact, when I got back from my last trip to Israel, I decided I was going to dedicate myself more to being Jewish. And then I became a Christian very shortly thereafter. So your goal, he says, is not to win the ball game, but instead to sort of give that pebble, that thing that sticks with people and nags at them and makes them think about things. You want to 
just, he says, get up to bat. That's all. That's all you want to do. And that takes pressure off us when we feel we have to hit a home run, when we feel we have to sew everything up. We feel a lot of pressure on ourselves. But if we're just witnessing, witnessing means you tell people what you saw, if we're just answering questions, and if we realize we're just one pebble in their shoe, boy, we don't have to hit that home run. We just have to do our part better. He says sometimes he'll even share his goal. I'm not here to convert you. Instead, I want to put a stone in your shoe. He'll come right out and say it. But you have to understand that that's how God's message works. It boils in people. It turns inside of people. And it's the Holy Spirit that convicts people. There's a lot of things going on when we just plant seeds. Or maybe we're the person who waters a seed. Or maybe we're the person who reaps the seed. You know, But we are just one little piece in this entire process. And so he'll give it throughout this course of the book, and I think this is where this book has a lot of power, where he will say responses he gives to people. If someone comes to you and says, well, you can't take the Bible too seriously. It, it was written by men and men make mistakes. Do you have books in your library? Were those books written by humans? Do you find truth in them? Is there any reason to think that the Bible is less truthful or reliable than other books that you own? Do people always make mistakes in what they write? Do you think if God exists, he would be capable of using human beings to write down exactly what he wants? If not, why not? You know, you get that idea. He, he is there to challenge people. And like I said, I think the real value of a lot of this books and some of his videos on YouTube is talking about how to talk to people. I remember I was watching a YouTube video the other week about a person who goes to campuses and, cha- and talks to people. And this guy says, well, if God's so good, why do I have to follow all his rules in order to get to heaven? Why doesn't he just take me to heaven? And the guy said, that would be kidnapping. You don't want to go to heaven. You don't want to be anywhere near God. And now you're asking him to kidnap you and make you go there anyway. He is letting you have exactly what you want. And that guy kind of stumbled and took a, a step back. And when you look at these videos of him and other evangelists out there, you can see these questions, this ability to ask questions back to people are important. He talks about situations where he'll say, well, people twist the Bible all the time. Uh, how can I trust what you're saying is true? And I'm like, but have I twisted my words? What, what did I say specifically that twisted my words? I mean, just because other people are twisting around words, what did, what did I do? You know, trying to ask that question and get Questions he says that will bring back dialogue, thoughtful dialogue, so that the person can communicate with you. And each of the questions are there to sort of dig a little bit deeper. And so he said that his first tactic is to have a handy solution to that problem, which is what he calls the queen mother. (laughs) And it's because it's flexible, adaptable. And what it is, is that you stop the challenger in the track and you get them to think about what they're saying through that conversation. He calls for this type of conversation in the TV show Columbo. And if you've never seen the TV show Columbo, it's, it's amazing to watch. My dad loved the show. And when he noticed I wasn't observing what was really going on, I was just watching a detective show, he pointed it out to me that Columbo mutters around to himself. He looks flubby. So he's basically not the guy that looks like he's intelligent. But he'll ask these very simple questions and he'll start it out with, do you mind if I ask you a question? So if you didn't like this guy or you didn't even want to be around this woman anymore, why did you get engaged to her? You know, something that would call something out, but in a very inoffensive way, ask these simple questions that will have this huge impact. And he said that sometimes these simple leading questions can have the biggest impact. The other thing, too, is sometimes you'll want to get an education. You want to understand what it is you're talking about. And the last point is, is that you'll want to make progress on the point without being preachy, pushy, all the P words, right? You want to take the pressure off and just relax and enjoy a conversation. I remember I made a mistake once where I wanted to talk to someone about something. And I said, hey, we're just having a good conversation here, right? Boy, that person was not interested in having a good, relaxing conversation. So you definitely have to read the room, but that's the kind of mood you want to have. 
we're just talking back and forth. We're having these ideas back and forth. We're not going to yell at you. You know, in my case, I just asked someone a simple question. and Boy, I got walloped in a big way. And I don't think that their walloping was correct, but they were so geared up for this fight that they just wanted to hit out at me, even though they were technically my friend. So he said the first thing you'll notice is when Lieutenant Colombo shows up at a crime scene, he gathers facts, which is the first thing you want to do. What do you mean by that? You're, you're asking questions. Why do you think everything is relative? Is even your statement about being relative relative? You know, that kind of thing. And then if you don't understand a point, you might get it wrong if you misrepresented itself. So what you want to make sure is you don't get caught up in these straw man fallacies, steel man fallacies, all these things. You want to ask good questions. You're going to come back and say, so you think all religions lead to the same place. Well, why do you think that? I mean, you know, what religions particularly do you think all lead to the same place or are exactly the same thing? Oh, well, I think this and this are the same thing. Well, yeah, you're right. They are very similar. But don't you think that in this case, you know, and then you ask more questions. So you can see that when you get into that thing where you're doing questions, he says, it'll serve you better. You're not putting people on the offensive and you're hearing more for them. You're asking for some kind of proof too. Well, what is your proof? You know, this was the one thing for me. The Bible was written by a bunch of men. It got mangled through the course of, you know, all the way to 300 AD. Probably didn't even happen for hundreds of years until after the time of Jesus. And then got written down by Constantine and some people in Rome. And now we got the Bible we got. Oh, well, what kind of evidence of that is true? Because the truth of the matter is the Bible was there from the very beginning. The apostles probably wrote it down when they realized they were going to die before seeing the end of the world. And church fathers from the very beginning of the church had pieces of scripture and knew people like Peter, knew people like John. So there were people who survived into the like 100s AD knowing apostles. But sometimes people like me heard that from someone. I just heard it from someone. I didn't have any evidence of it. And if someone had said to me, well, what is your evidence that the Bible was just written and mauled by a bunch of people in 300 AD? It's not true. Then you can come back and say, well, actually, what, how, how the Bible got written down is X, Y, and Z. But once you ask enough questions and you challenge people on some of their thoughts, sometimes what you'll find out, too, is you, you, there be, might be a person like me where they got some information from someone else. They don't know what's true or what's not true. And their knowledge is what I always call um, a mile wide and an inch deep. I know a lot about religion and I knew a lot about history, but it was only an inch deep. I didn't know anything about the church fathers. I didn't know how the Bible actually got written down. And I don't know that there was a lot of agreement on 80% of the Bible. It's just a few books. And I didn't know that there were only about 40 lines of scripture that had big differences between them in the entire, like every scrap of writing we had. I think there was a total of 400 different sentences, but a majority of them were just the differences between saying this or that, you know, very minor. And 40 of them were substantial and are notated in the Bible saying the earliest chapters didn't have this book or the mark of the beast, I think, is either 666 or 616 because there's dispute there. The Bible comes out and tells you right away, this is a disputed chapter. You're not going to be that one person over the course of 2,000 years who figures out the one amazing thing you're going to say that's going to destroy Christianity because we found it to be a falsehood. But that's what you're thinking in your head. I'm going to say this one thing. I'm going to lay it out there. And this person is going to go, oh, I never really thought about that, right? This has been debated, teased out, looked at, examined over and over again by all these people. And in fact, when I was in college, even so many things were told to me. Oh, we don't even think this city exists. We've never found this bath. We've never found any piece of the Bible or any people in the Bible. And now all that since then has been proved untrue because our methods of archaeology have gotten better. Our methods of finding things have gotten better. And 
you'll you'll find that when they say, oh, there's no evidence of the Exodus, now there's a ton of evidence of the Exodus. So you you'll get there, but sometimes people don't know. And like I said, their knowledge of this is very shallow. They just heard something that someone told them once. Oh, the Bible is completely untrue, made up with men, and it wasn't even written down until 300 AD. Really? Is that true? And so then once you start asking those questions, you start driving some directed issues, you'll find out that that person doesn't know how the Bible got created, or they don't know that there's evidence for this or that. And the thing that they thought was true is no longer true. And you could have been someone like me who always had the question. And most atheists always do have that one question that shuts up Christians. Mine was, do you think I'm going to hell? Because I was a nice person. And it's mean to say a nice person is going to go to hell. Do you have a response to that? Other people are like, well, how did Noah get the dinosaurs on the ark? You know, all sorts of things that are just people trying to slam dunk you in a debate instead of having a thorough conversation with you. And the one I hear all the time, too, is, oh, Paul created the church. Jesus didn't say he was God. He didn't say he was a messiah. This is all the creation of the apostles because they were trying to look good. And my first thought is, have you read the New Testament? The apostles didn't look good. If I were writing a book about me meeting Jesus, you would say, well, I was his star disciple. I did all the things that Jesus asked me to do, and I did it correctly. That is not what the New Testament says at all. If it is like what my dad called it, a piece of propaganda to make the apostles look good or to say that Israel should get rid of the Romans, they read the wrong book. This is not what this book says at all. But he says what he'll often do is he keeps a copy of John with him and says, well, fine, let's just let Jesus speak for himself. These are the things that Jesus said about himself. You know, this isn't Paul making a statement. This isn't someone 300 AD making a statement. This is Jesus himself talking in John. And one of the nice things about John is it was written probably around 90 AD while John was either in exile or just after he got out of exile. He had time to read the other gospels, the synoptic gospels. So he didn't have to go and cover old territory. Oh, well, you know, Matthew wrote all about the Jewishness of Jesus. I'm going to take a a stance about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I'm going to dig deep into that. When you start off, with these questions, and they're neutral. You're not trying to hammer people with them. You're not trying to preach with those questions. You're not going to ask them these deep dives into that. That will help you in this process. He gives these four steps of, of what Colombo does. So first, he asks the innocent questions. Then he asks them for some kind of proof. Well, where, where's your proof that the Bible wasn't created? Or people will say, no, the earth was created through the Big Bang process. The whole universe was in the Big Bang process. Was it? Because I remember when I was in college in astronomy, people talked about primordial soup and how that created life on earth. Now nobody believes that anymore. So it just happened all by itself. How do you know? But in this case, he says, well, the Big Bang doesn't need God or doesn't have God. There's no God in the Big Bang. And you don't have to say whether or not you believe in the Big Bang or you're part of it or any of that. But who says the Big Bang doesn't have God interacting it? How do you know it doesn't? Well, it just happened by accident. But I mean, I get that. But how do you know? What is your proof that that was all the Big Bang, the primordial soup, whatever it is you call? How do you know that's by accident? I think it's a good way. And so he said that if you get into these conversations, like talking about, that the Big Bang doesn't need intelligent design. If read, there's a, a hydrogen to matter coefficient. And so how much matter is created from single particles. And if it's too small, matter and our Earth would be so separated away from each other, it would never come together and form into a universe. If it's too big, the universe would be filled with so much stuff that you couldn't form planets or anything else like that. So. One tiny mistake in any of the physics, in any of how our chemistry came through in the Big Bang, would mean there's no planets, no galaxy, no life, nothing like that. So you can see where he's talking about asking these questions of proof 
That's step number two. And he says sometimes you'll get people caught off guard that they don't know the reason. I just believe it. I don't believe that the Big Bang needs God. Well, why would you believe something without having ev- any evidence of it? And you're saying, I don't have any evidence of God, but you're saying you believe in the Big Bang needed no God without evidence. How did you come to that conclusion? You could see where it's going. And so sometimes the other thing Columbo would do, and he said in this book, was have an alternate explanation so that you can see it could go like this too, just as easily. It could go that the Big Bang had intervention from intelligence, God, to create this in a specific way so planets, solar system, and life would thrive. He said the second rule of Columbo is not a trick. It's not trying to avoid the burden of proof. In fact, it's asking for proof, saying, you're looking for proof for me. What is your proof that you can give to me? And he says it's good when we do this because we learn reasoning. We learn human understanding this way. And we also learn how opinions aren't proof, right? If you say, I just believe the Big Bang didn't need God. Fine, that's fine. I think it does. But the question is, is where's your proof? You're asking it of me. Where is yours? And he said, oftentimes people will tell a story or something like that. That is in no way evidence. And so, again, if you ask those good questions and you ask for that burden of proof, it'll help. My challenge to you is think a little bit about some debates that you've gotten into. How can you use these two steps of the Columbo system, one, asking great questions, and two, asking for proof, to make that conversation go better? Would it have been better to just ask for more information so that you understood that position better? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear debates and things that you've gotten yourself into. As an atheist, you know, I've had quite the few in my life. And sometimes I felt like I knew what I was talking about. Sometimes I thought I had good reasons for it. But other times I have to tell you, I just had the mile wide and the inch deep uh, theory of something I didn't know. And I was just challenging people for that. And remember, our walk to having true dialogue with other people starts with small steps. 